In my earlier talks on reincarnation, I posed five great questions. Who are we here on earth? Where do we come from, this human race of ours? Why are we here at all? Where do we go to from here? And why do we have to suffer pain during life on earth? First of all then, why are we here? Consider these famous words. The Lord let the house of the brute to the soul of a man. And the man said, am I your debtor? The Lord said, not yet, but make it as clean as you can. And then I'll let you a better. Henry Ford, the Henry Ford, was also obsessed by this question of the purpose of existence. It was 1938 and this was the answer he gave. When I was a young man, like so many others, I was bewildered. I found myself asking the question, what are we here for? And I found no answer. Without some answer to that question, life is empty and useless. Then someone handed him a book on reincarnation. And after reading it, Henry Ford said, it changed my whole life. From emptiness and uselessness, it changed my outlook on life to purpose and meaning. I believe we are here now for a purpose and will come back again. Of this I am sure. He said, mind and memory do not stop with death. They go on and on. They are the Eternals. Earlier, Henry Ford had said, I adopted the theory of reincarnation when I was 26. Religion offered nothing to the point. Even work could not give me complete satisfaction. Work seemed futile if we cannot utilize the experience we collect in one life in the next life. Then I discovered reincarnation. It was as if I had discovered a universal plan. I realized it was a chance to work out my own ideas. Time was no longer the limiting factor. I was no longer a slave to the hands of the clock. He said, genius is experience. Some seem to think it is a gift or a talent, but it is the fruit of long experience over many lives. Some are older souls than others, and so they know more. Henry Ford said that the effect of discovering reincarnation was that it put his mind at ease. He said, if you preserve a record of this conversation, let other men know so that it puts their minds at ease. Then there was Lloyd George, British Prime Minister at the end of World War I. He said, my opinion is that we shall be reincarnated and that hereafter we shall suffer or benefit in accordance with what we have done in this world. For example, the employer who sweats his work people will be condemned to sweat himself in lives to come. It is thus pure nonsense to say that only cranks and Easterners Eccentrics and dropouts believe in reincarnation. Millionaires, prime ministers, generals and archaeologists accept it. Henry Schliemann, Henry Schliemann, the great archaeologist, grew up believing that it was his life's purpose to locate the lost city of Troy. By sheer business ability, he made himself a millionaire while he was still in his twenties. He then forsook business for archaeology. He was convinced he was the reincarnation of a man who had once lived in Troy, and he was determined to find the city and excavate it. After travelling to Turkey, he chose a site to excavate. Every archaeologist of note scoffed at him. They said Troy was miles away. But Schliemann kept digging and eventually unearthed the ancient city, salvaged much treasure and gained a wealth of information. And then General Patton. 
the American army commander who smashed his way into Germany at the end of World War II. He believed he was a soldier in North Africa when Hannibal was the Carthaginian leader. He sought out the very place where he had once fought. Pythagoras, he believed he was a young soldier called Euphorbius in the Trojan War, killed by Menelaus. As a reincarnationist, I like to think that I march in step with such other death-defying beings who accepted reincarnation, like Thomas Edison, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Albert Schweitzer, Leo Chu, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. I like to think of reincarnation as a dialogue between man and nature, between a man and his own soul, that wise ancient of days who retains the experiences of many lives and which Henry Ford spoke about. We keep up a sort of cosmic catechism with our souls and constantly ask, who am I? Why am I here? Who was I before? What from past experiences am I able to do now? With this poetry or painting, what shall I do with it? Should I be a general, a carpenter, a diplomat? How can I help mankind? Socrates maintained a constant dialogue with such an inner being whom he called his daemon, a being as wise and as old as time itself. Socrates was greatly concerned with the talents and capacities bestowed on us by our previous lives. He thought that teaching was not so much a thing placed in us by another, but rather something unveiled that was already there. He demonstrated this to his followers by questioning a slave boy who had never been taught mathematics. Socrates evoked from the boy observations and insights into mathematics that had never been taught to him. To Socrates, it was self-evident that the boy's capacities were the results of experiences had in previous lives. Socrates' purpose was to stir men up so that traces of knowledge garnered in previous lives could surface and become alive again. As it turns out, this technique that Socrates used so expertly differs little from the techniques of modern depth psychologists. Using something of these techniques, I myself in spiritual consultations have always asked this question. Why do you think you're here on earth? Ninety percent of my subjects have given the same answer and I'm speaking about some 5,000 people over a period of 30 years. Their answer was, I think I'm here to learn something. And then I would ask them, do you think that you can learn at all in this one life? It was only in very rare instances that anyone ventured to say that they could. Almost everyone said, oh no. I would need many lives to learn it all in. I might say that nearly all had had a Christian upbringing. They all believed that it takes many, many lives indeed to learn what this earth has to offer. So much for the Christian outlook. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the famous research worker who wrote the book Death and Dying said, there are many lives we have to live. We have to live through them in order to learn all the lessons. What are the general purposes of reincarnating? What sort of lessons do we have to learn here on earth? Why so many lives to learn just one lesson? Discrimination is one of the most important lessons which we must learn. First, we must learn to identify the quiet, the quiet, subtle voice of the soul. Some call it the voice of the silence. 
I don't want to come back again, is a frequently heard cry. I've had enough. But who is uttering these words? Certainly not the soul. The soul is always crying out for expression, calling for any action that will further it on the road towards truth, beauty and goodness. So said Plato. A few setbacks in this life are not going to deter the immortal soul. First identify this eternal part of you. Let it be heard. You will soon find that it has a very, very different set of a in this life to those which are dictated to you by your personality, by your ego. Your ego that is so fallible and transient and unreliable and often alienated from the truth, from beauty and goodness. Other famous lines from antiquity, the soul of man is immortal and its future is the future of a thing whose growth and splendor has no limit. Each man is his own absolute lawgiver. He is the dispenser of glory or gloom to himself. He is the decreer of his own life, his own reward and his own punishment. To recognize the language and principles of the soul and then to communicate with a higher self and do its bidding requires the experience of many lives. The processes involve a growth of spirituality in the personality sheaths that are reincarnated into. What is spirituality? My own definition is repeated in many books. It has little to do with religious claptrap. Spirituality is the effort put into raising the consciousness of all the kingdoms of life about you, including your own. The nurturing of plants, the wearing of certain gemstones, the domesticating of animals, the healing and teaching of humans, meditating, praying, loving, loving wisely, applying wisdom lovingly, justice, compassion, mercy, focused will, interacting with nature. This list is endless and offers man a myriad of opportunities to unfold. But it takes many lives even after the elements of discrimination have been learnt. Here are lines from an invocation that is famous. From the unreal, lead me to the real. From darkness, lead me to light. From death, lead me to immortality. As the planet begins to crowd, as the fruits of science provide us with more leisure, unparalleled opportunities arise for us to find space in our daily lives to exercise the faculties of the soul. And we need not despair if we cannot accomplish all in this life, in other lives, we can take up the same work afresh in a new body. Christopher Fry, the poet, feels that opportunity for man is here, that there is an end to his winter or spiritual sterility. He wrote, The human hearts can go the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries breaks, cracks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now, when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul man ever took. Affairs are now soul size. Where are you making for? It takes so many lives to wake, but will you wake for pity's sake? The enterprise is exploration into God. Christopher Fry's lovely words. Through belief and reincarnation, purpose is infused into the life. Meditations, mantras and evocations frequently emphasize the need for purpose purpose to strengthen the will in the disciple's life, as in the great invocation of Alice Bailey. 
From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. It's always easier just to deny the existence of the soul than to affirm it, than to seek for real evidence of its imminence. To deny the existence of the soul is to deny that you have a conscience, is to deny that the ship of your personality has a captain. To deny the soul is like stating that you are on a ship without a rudder, a great sage observed that the easiest way to deal with a soul is to deny it. He said, can you suppose that a ship might be constructed of such a kind that entirely by itself, without a captain or a crew, it could sail from place to place, from year to year, accommodating itself to varying winds, avoiding shoals, seeking a haven when necessary, and doing all that a normal ship can, without a captain or a navigator? The man who denies his soul maintains just this. Many recognize that they have a strong force within them, always accompanying them, and acting as the voice of the conscience, the voice of the silence. But they fear it, the threat that that voice poses to the way they are conducting their lives. They brush it aside. Francis Thompson, a great mystical poet of the last century, wrote a beautiful poem describing this and likens the soul to a bloodhound a bloodhound ever at the heels of the personality. He called the poem the Hound of Heaven. Let me quote you a few lines from it. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth and ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears I hid from him and under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped and shot, precipitated down titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat and a voice beat more instant than the feet, all things betray thee who betrayest me. The hound of heaven, the conscience of man. A very, very old structure, elaborated over many, many lives on earth. Sooner or later we all come into contact with genius. In 1751, Marion Davis, aged seven, gave a concert in London playing the harpsichord and the flute to perfection. At age five, young Paxton, now a young man in England, a restauranteur's son, could put the components of a radio set together and make it work. My own research showed that in his previous life, he was a researcher in the Phillips factory in Holland. A Coventry boy named Adrian Stevens, an 11-year-old, has just become a trainee pilot. Researched, I found him to be the reincarnation of a wartime pilot called Lacey, shot down and lost over Germany during World War II. The first sentence that the young Lord Macaulay the historian that we know, spoke, was at 18 months of age, and the baby said, is the smoke of that chimney coming from hell? The belief in reincarnation is not like the spread of a religion. We have no Billy Grahams for it. There are no evangelists, no preachers representing it. 
the spread of the concept of reincarnation seems to be the result of either a welling up of an intuitive feeling about it on the one hand and a conviction about its validity that comes from an experience, a sort of spiritual deja vu. I've been here before. As Schopenhauer said, it presents itself as a natural conviction of man. Whenever he reflects at all in any unprejudiced manner on the nature of life and death. Now what about this matter of the implausibility of reincarnation? How could it possibly be? Well I say to that that we don't remember previous lives. The skeptics say if you don't remember previous lives then they probably didn't exist. And the answer to that is simple. There are many events in this life that we don't recall. Even though we patently lived those events out, we don't remember the first years of our life, but our childhood was there all the time. We don't remember what happens while we are asleep, but it doesn't mean that we were dead or non-existent during sleep. Previous lives provide us all with a potential. We may not remember previous lives, but they still did exist and have left behind them great reservoirs of energy peculiar to them. These remain as a potential of energy which we can draw on. Some of us, the older souls, have deep roots going back to experiences and talents won in those former lives. Henry Ford is one of these, as we have seen, with deep roots. The German poet Goethe was another, and the Greek philosopher Socrates. They all spoke of them. George Santayana, the philosopher, knew Goethe's works well, and he explained Goethe's views. A deep mind has deep roots in nature, and that mind will bloom again and again. But what a deep mind carries over into its next incarnation is not the conventional merits and demerits, its load of remorse, or its sordid superficial memories. These are washed away by the baptism of the new rebirth. What remains is only what was deep in that deep mind. Things so deep that new situations of our new lives may again admit them the words of George Santayana. Socrates wanted such deep knowledge to act as a fountain of truth in each person. No one barred from it. Goethe was delighted with the way in which reincarnation wiped the slate of previous memories clean. He said, how well it is that men should die if only to erase their impressions and return them clean washed to a new life. Goethe on the subject. But of course Goethe wrote that his friend Frau von Steen, his great inspirer, had once been his wife and at another time had been his sister. How else, Goethe asked, could she know him so intimately Tell me why we too have drawn so near. In since you were my sister, sharing kin with me, or else my wife most dear. Everything I am, my every feature you have divined, my every nerve you can thrill. You can read me at a glance. No other creature knows me as you know me, nor ever will. Charles Emerson, the brother of Ralph Waldo Emerson, felt his roots deeply enough. He wrote, The reason why Homer is to me like a dewy morning is because I too lived while Troy was and sailed in the hollow ships of the Grecians to sack 
like the devoted town. The rosy-fingered dawn is at crimson, the tops of Ida, the broad seashore dotted with tents, the Trojan hosts in their painted armour, and the rushing chariots of Diomedes and Idomeneus. All these I too saw. My ghost animated the frame of some nameless argive. We forget that we have been drugged with a sleepy bowl of the present. But when a lively chord in the soul is struck, when the windows for a moment are unbarred, the long and varied past is recovered. We recognize it all. We are no more brief, ignoble creatures. We seize our immortality and bind together the related parts of our secular being. The words of Charles Emerson, brother of Ralph Waldo. Evidence of immortality and cases of rebirth. I'm going to present a few cases which I have selected out of the thousands, of course, that exist. There are thousands of cases that are suggestive of reincarnation, but not one of them is proof of reincarnation. Dr. Ian Stevenson has selected 20 cases, and he has written a very good book on them. And indeed, the book presents good evidence as to the validity of them, but they do not constitute proof. Edgar Casey, the clairvoyant from Virginia Beach, gave examples of previous lives and the karma associated with those lives. But we must state that no case, no matter how clearly presented, is proof of reincarnation mainly because it would not satisfy the criteria of science. In the end, this matter is very personal. We all have to be convinced for ourselves and in our own manner. Sooner or later, some striking matter will come up for your attention and you will say to yourself, the only way that I can explain this event is that it is related to rebirth. So let us consider some cases for reincarnation. Children often provide the best evidence when they make statements in all innocence, which are later verifiable. The rebirth of Katsugoro is recorded in detail and with many affidavits respecting the facts in an old Japanese document. The story is, in brief, that a young boy called Katsugoro, son of a man called Genzo in the village of Nakanomura, declared that in his preceding life, a few years before, he had been called Tozo, that he was then the son of a farmer called Kubei, and his wife Shizu in a village Hodokubu that his father had died and had been replaced in the household by a man called Hanshiro, and that he himself, Tozo, had died of smallpox at the age of six, a year after his father. He eventually was taken to their village, where such persons were indeed found. He himself led the way to their house and recognized them, and they confirmed the facts that he had related. Further, he pointed to a shop and a tree, saying that they had not been there before, and this was true. Now for a case of reincarnation which I have taken from my own experiences. In 1958, I was touring Rhodesia, now called Zimbabwe, on lecture tour. And I had just given a lecture on reincarnation. After the lecture, a lady came up from the audience and asked me if she could have a consultation. She wanted to talk about a very personal matter. She told me that 10 years earlier, 
She had a little daughter who had died at the age of four, greatly upsetting the couple. They didn't often talk about the child, but then a second daughter was born and they were overcome with joy. Now when the girl was about the same age as the first daughter had been when she died, her mother was bathing her one day and sang to her as was usual. The little girl interrupted her mother and asked her to sing the song that she used to sing. The mother was puzzled and asked the girl to tell her how it went. And the child to sing the Yellow Rose of Texas. Oh, the Yellow Rose of Texas, it's the Yellow Rose for me. Da 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 You probably all know the song. The mother froze. She had always sung that song to her first child. But never since her first child died, it had been too painful for her. She was convinced, absolutely convinced, that her first child was now inside her second child. This woman was well known in the district. She had no reason to impress me. In fact, I never saw her again. And so her testimony is probably valid. I certainly didn't have the opportunity to research it myself, but I would regard it as a very important contribution to our knowledge of reincarnation. That children, and indeed even adults, overshadow individuals in a family if they are cut off from life very early is well known, particularly with regard to twins. If one twin dies early in life, you can expect an overshadowing of the other twin by the astral counterpart of the dead, the dead one. Elvis Presley had a twin, and the child died young, and he maintained, it was supported by his mother, he maintained that he talked to his twin brother all his life. The mother believed, Elvis Presley's mother believed, that the boy strengthened Elvis whenever he was depressed or down. And I believe she was right. The influence of a twin is not always benign if the twin dies. The Zulus in South Africa very frequently killed a twin if the twin was threatening the uh, heir to a throne, heir to one of their chieftains. And so this matter is something which is of interest to all of us. I want to also mention the matter of John Lennon. In esoteric work, we very frequently recognize a set of symbols which appear constantly in our dreams. For instance, the automobile, which is the main partner of the American, is frequently in dreams playing a role that is unusual. In the dreams of esoteric people, the automobile, the car that they drive, is the personality. And the one driving the car is the soul. And the relationship of the driver to the automobile that he is driving is taken to be the relationship of the soul to its personality vehicle in this life. 
For many years, I pondered over the different symbologies of the automobile. And most of them were understandable. If the automobile did not respond when you put the brakes on, it meant that the soul was unable to control its personality. But there was one aspect of it that I did not understand. This was when the driver of an automobile would get out of the car and get into another. Frequently it was an old person or it was a person that was accident prone. And because of this, I find that John Lennon's remarks about death are very pertinent. Lennon was asked what he thought about death. He said, I'm always prepared for death because I don't believe in it. It's just getting out of one car and getting into another. And when I read that phrase some ten years ago, I suddenly realized that this phenomenon in the dream experience is an indication of death. That the person getting out of the car and into another is a person who's going to, presumably, draw close to death. And I think that Lennon's observation is very valid. That life is like that. We get out of one car into another. But when I say we, of course, we mean the soul. From one personality into another. I have another story to tell from my own life and it concerns what I think is quite an extraordinary phenomenon with many esoteric implications. I lived in South Africa in the town of Durban and from a very early age became associated with a boy of my own age whose name was Dennis Baker. We had the same initials and the same surname. Dennis was a close friend. I suppose I could say I grew up with him. And the other extraordinary thing about this association was that we were both born on the same day, exactly the same day, the 31st of December, 1922. He was born at noon, and I was born on the stroke of midnight. We were buddies. We were different in some ways. He liked golf, I pre preferred tennis. I was a year ahead of him at school, and when war broke out, we both joined within the same month at the age of 16. He joined the Navy, and I joined the Army. He sailed off, off from Durban, and eventually joined the ship, Her Majesty's battleship Barham. And I went north to the desert in North Africa with my regiment. In December 1941, with my regiment, I was near the desert city of Bardia, and there was a huge explosion out at sea. A great plummet of smoke rose some 20 or 30 miles out at sea, and we all wondered what it was. Later, I heard that it was the battleship Barham torpedoed off the coast of North Africa. By a strange set of circumstances, Dennis Baker had met up with me, at least to a distance of 20 miles apart, in December 1941. Because of the differences in our horoscope, which I'm not going to go into now, he was at sea in a ship, 
I was on land 20 miles away in, um, in a regiment which I suppose we could say was infantry. He was killed in that blast and bearing in mind the progression of the moon, his, he being born at noon and my being born at midnight on the same day, I suppose I should have anticipated the fact that some 12 months later I myself would be very badly wounded in the Battle of El Alamein. He did not survive, I did survive. A set of circumstances which normally would pass as coincidence, except when you understand the phenomenon of reincarnation. Now I want to shift the scene from Durban to London to 1964, some 21 or two years later. I was a medical student and had an apartment in Regent's Park Road in London. And I was there one day for a weekend because I spent most of my time at the university in Sheffield. And the people who lived in the apartment above me brought down a friend of theirs and introduced him to me. The moment I was introduced to this young man, I was absolutely staggered by the resemblance that he had to Dennis Baker. Not only that, but his interests were mainly focused on South Africa. They knew that I had grown up in South Africa and that this youth, now 18, in the British Army, was interested in that country, and for no apparent reason he couldn't explain it. As I said, I was staggered by his resemblance to Dennis Baker. He also wore a crew cut, as Dennis Baker did. He was keen on golf and played regularly, and he had that peculiar manner of being startled at almost anything that was said to him. I did some research into it and found that indeed it was true. He was the reincarnation of Dennis Baker. Unfortunately, I lost touch with him because I was tied up at medical school and he went abroad. As I said earlier, it's only when you have these very personal experiences with all the accompanying energies that you are inclined to be drawn into confirming that for you reincarnation is a fact of life. I want to read to you now what I consider the best evidence of reincarnation that I know of. One day in Santa Barbara, California, a man by the name of Roberts came to a trained clairvoyant, who was also a lecturer on theosophy, and asked for help in a perplexing case. Mr. Roberts had been walking in the street the previous day when a little three-year-old girl came up to him and put her arms around his knees and called him Papa. Mr. Roberts was indignant, thinking that someone was trying to father the child on him, but the mother of the child who came up directly was equally put out and tried to get the child away. The child, however, kept on clinging to Mr. Roberts, insisting that he was her father. Because of the circumstances to be told later, Mr. Roberts could not put it out of his mind and sought out the clairvoyant who accompanied him to the house of the child's parents, where the little girl at once ran up to him again and again called him Papa. 
The clairvoyant, whom we shall call Mr. X, found, however, that the child was normal, and next proceeded to question the little one carefully. After patient work carried on intermittently during the afternoon, so as not to tire the child, this is the story she told. She had lived with her papa, Mr. Roberts, and another mama in a little house that stood alone, where no other house could be seen. There was a little brook close to the house, where some flowers grew, and here she ran out and brought in some pussy willows, and there was a plank across the brook for which she was cautioned against crossing, for fear she might fall into the brook. One day her papa left her mother and herself and had not returned. When their supply of food was exhausted, her mama lay down on the bed and became so still. At last she said quaintly, Then I also died, but I didn't die. I came here. Mr. Roberts next told his story. Eighteen years before, he lived in London, where his father was a brewer. He fell in love with their servant girl. His father objected, so he eloped with her to Australia, after they had first been married. Here he went out into the bush and cleared a little farm where he erected a small cabin by a brook, just described by the little girl. A daughter was born to them there, and when she was about two years old, he left the house one morning and went to a clearing some distance from the house. And while there, a man with a rifle came up to him, saying that he was arresting him in the name of the law for a bank robbery committed on the night Mr. Roberts had left England. The officer had tracked him to that place, thinking him the criminal. Mr. Roberts begged to be allowed to go to his wife and child, but thinking this a ruse to entrap him into the hands of Confederates, the officer refused and drove him to the coast at the point of a gun. He was taken to England and tried, and his innocence proved. First then did the authorities take heed of his constant ravings about his wife and child, whom he knew must starve in that wild and lonely country. An expedition was sent out to the cabin, when it was found that only the skeletons of the wife and child remained. Mr. Roberts's father died in the meantime, and although he had disinherited Mr. Roberts, his brothers divided with him and he came to America a broken man. He then produced photographs of himself and his wife, and at the suggestion of Mr. X, they were mixed with a number of other photographs and shown to the little girl, who unhesitatingly picked out the photographs of both her alleged parents, although the photograph shown was very different from the present appearance of Mr. Roberts. As I said earlier, sometimes the testimony of a child in her innocence is very much more impelling than that of an adult. Now it's ridiculous to say that we are not used to death and dying. We have died a thousand times. It's true to say that we can sit around a dinner table and discuss war and the probable death of 60 million humans through an atom bomb without being more upset than if we were discussing how ba bad the weather was. Every day we can watch abrupt and bloody death on television and on films without blinking back a tear. And that is, of course, because we have known in previous lives the matter of death and dying. Most patients accept death serenely and without fear. Most appear, appear to be preparing themselves for it, as though they are intuitively familiar with the whole business, so that we think that death is a natural matter. Where did we learn this from? Not only in one life, but over many, many hundreds of lives. 
equally so. We feel that rebirth or reincarnation is an intuitive feeling which is had by countless people living in remote quarters of the globe. As Schopenhauer, the great philosopher, said, it presents itself as a natural conviction of man whenever he reflects at all in an unprejudiced manner on the way of the world. One of the first fruits of accepting reincarnation is that we begin to see meaning in life around us, meaning that we had not noted before. The sea seems to sound the note of the solar system. Views of a mountain elevate our own psyche. We feel the pains of the patient we're trying to cure. We see meaning in everything. Cite the example of the delphinium. A flower I have always loved and valued as my own mentor. The delphinium, by analogy, suggests a soul expressing itself through many lives, through many florets. The whole of the inflorescence represents the delphinium. But see how each floret is opening spirally around the central stem or hub of its soul. Not all the lives have been opened yet. They've not all been lived in. See, there are florets that are buds at the top of the plant. And see how when the florets wither, they leave behind them these tiny gynesiums which contain the essences of those personalities. We call this cyclospiritual metamorphosis. All florets contribute to the truth, beauty, and goodness of the delphinium. The soul is the sum total of all its personality atma, its personality buddhi, and its personality manas. The spiritual qualities, in fact, of its florets. How ridiculous it would be to suggest that a single floret is the delphinium, or that a single life is the totality of a person's nature or consciousness. From the cosmic viewpoint, all lives are one. All florets are part of the one flower, the delphinium itself. And now I end again with Macefield's immortal lines. I hold that when a person dies, his soul returns again to earth. Arrayed in some new flesh disguise, another mother gives him birth. With sturdier limbs and brighter brain, the old soul takes the road again. Thank you. Dr. Baker has spent 40 years of his life studying the ancient wisdom. His tireless efforts to make this knowledge available to all has resulted in the production of nearly 100 books covering virtually every aspect of the esoteric. The Jewel in the Lotus, a valuable introduction into the postulates and teachings of the ancient wisdom. Meditation, a practical guide to the art of communication between kingdoms and the recharging of personality with spiritual energy. Esoteric Healing, three volumes covering many aspects of this important subject. It is based on Dr. Baker's own research and medical expertise. Anthropogeny. Man is far older than scientific theory would have us believe. This book explores the cosmic origins of man reaching back to before time itself. Esoteric Psychology. An in-depth study of the seven rays, how they influence man, and how to analyze one's own rays and those of others. The Psychology of Discipleship. At last a guide for those increasing numbers of people consciously treading the path of spiritual unfoldment. A difficult and arduous task made easier by the knowledge that others have succeeded and left signposts on the way for those who follow. Esoteric Astrology. Dr. Baker has spent 40 years developing a growing understanding of this exacting science. 
fast becoming accepted as the astrology of the new age, these 12 volumes provide a unique basis for a thorough knowledge of esoteric astrology. They teach you to interpret horoscopes and gain an awareness of that most important of subjects, the soul's purpose. These are just a few of the publications available. In addition to this growing number of books, there are 200 live recordings of Dr. Baker's public lectures made during his extensive tours of North America and Europe during the 1970s and 80s. For information about any of these products and for other video lectures, write to the address on the cover of this video cassette.